There is a lot of new and exciting changes and additions coming in Shadowlands, and with that release drawing ever closer now, let's round up all the new big new features that are coming in Shadowlands and all the minor changes to the game that might surprise you, especially for its end game as it feels very much different in comparison to the last two expansions. Bear in mind, this is more to highlight and to let you know everything that is coming in Shadowlands. Tuning is still ongoing, so it's likely that number stuff, requirements, values might change a bit, so make sure to subscribe and all of that good stuff as more proper in-depth guides will be put out for each of these new big features and systems closer to the release of Shadowlands itself. Some features introduced in Shadowlands have already been covered here in the channel uh, in the everything that is coming in the Shadowlands pre-patch, so make sure to check that out as well. Right, let's get started then. Let's kick it off with none other than Covenants. Covenants have a pretty bad rap due to their Covenant abilities and powers, that is very much true, but there's no denying that aside from that and some story inconsistencies, putting it lightly, there is a lot of cool things coming in Covenants. For quick context, when you reach the Shadowlands after the typical introductory scenario quest and being presented at the fantastic looking capital of Oribos, you will go off to level in all the four zones of the Shadowlands in order to essentially, without spoilers, understand what is happening in this realm of death and help the various factions, covenants, and some old beloved characters. Bastion, where you'll meet the Kyrian, Maldrax the Necrolords, Ardenwild, the Nightfay, and Ravendrath with the Venthyr. And this is respectively, as this time around, for our first character, we will follow a linear leveling experience where we have to go through and complete all the main campaign-like quests in each of the Shadowlands zones, no matter if you reach the cap early or not. So the speed of your leveling will not matter if you're not actually doing the main quests, reasons as to why are explained later. So through this linear leveling experience, as you go through each of these zones, you'll be able to play with the various covenant abilities offered by these factions, along with getting various ranks and new slash old abilities as you level from level 50 to level 60. These powers will come in two thematic abilities, one that is covenant-based, that no matter the class that you play, you will get, like say the Venthyr Teleport, Door of Shadows, Soul Shape for the Night Fae, an Absorb Shield, Fleshcraft from the Necrolords, and a Steward, best known as Wilkins, for the Kyrian, providing you with potions and other goodies. Coupled with a class-based ability, a glorified talent that may enhance your gameplay like, say, Condemn, from the Venthyr as a warrior, and so on. Uh, Covenant abilities will be covered in a future video as well, so don't worry about that. Now, why is this important? Well, at Cap, and after finishing all of the set campaign quests that finishes off in a scenario, as it's typical, you will be given the much debated choice of choosing your covenant. Hence why you need to finish all the zones in all the campaign quests, as it's giving you a small window of what you can expect at endgame and what these covenants offer, as they're gonna permanently give you the abilities and then you're gonna continue the campaign, the story through the campaign covenant campaign quests. Even though you are still a very important person for each of these covenants and done very unique and powerful things with each of them, but uh, we don't talk about that. That said, if you're not googling what is my best overall covenant for big deeps omega lol, make sure to play around with these abilities as much as possible so you can make a decision that you won't regret later. You can try them out again on dummies before you decide, and you can even take them out in the open worlds to make sure you really like that ability as a trial essentially, even in dungeons, so that's pretty good. Now outside of the abilities, Covenants will offer one more character power-based feature and a whole lot of others which are entirely for your own personal fun and pleasure. That is right, fun. The immediate ones you're gonna notice is of course the transmog set, a thematic mount and a unique-ish story like the campaign that I have mentioned that you can also preview while choosing your covenant, but there is much more than that. Covenants will offer your own base of operations, a hall, a garrison called the Sanctum, gorgeous pieces of art and it is from here you will set out to do a lot of your in-game features that we're gonna cover. It is also here where you will get your other power-based feature, the Soulbinds and conduits. 
Soulbinds are essentially characters, like Theothar the Mad or Pelagus. You can think of them a bit like Azerite Armor, but in a character form. You'll meet these characters as you level in the respective zones of the Covenant, and they will offer these little talents, or rather, trait trees for you to choose, some additional powers for your character that are entirely class-wide. Everyone gets the same ones. Some of them will be pure power based, like flat damage increases or a stat buff, some will be flavorful, like a free transmog cost or profession mats. Three unique soulbinds will be offered for each covenant, of which you can access their menu in the Forge of Bonds, inside of your sanctum, with the one soulbind immediately given to you the minute that you join your covenant, with the other two unlocked as you follow your covenant campaign questline, the continuation of your leveling experience, offering other trades and allowing you to create some loadouts and place different conduits. As you can change uh, soulbind traits freely at the Forge of Bonds, or change the soulbinds themselves, the characters, with the tomb, just like your talents, or at the Forge. Again, we'll go much more in depth with these uh, traits with a dedicated guide, but you get the idea of what you're getting. Pretty simple upgrades. What is conduits then? Conduits are more class or spec specific. We're gonna have uh, three types potency, finesse, and endurance, each enhancing types of abilities that each spec and class has, DPS, or just raw power, survivability, and utility. You're then gonna slot these conduits in their respective slots, through a library system resembling the essence system in between the soulbind traits, filling in the gaps. Potency slots are for the most part flat damage increases, cooldown reductions, uptime increases and so on that may create synergies with some covenant ability, legendaries that we can cover later, or talents, like say buffing a chain heal for an additional jump, coupled with a high tide talent. Some may even change gameplay slightly, such as providing a proc. As an example, on Shadow Priest's uh, Descendant Echoes giving you a Void World proc, even without being in Void form, on the Mindfully Ticks. But for the most part, they are just flat, passive, damage increased things. Now, where do you get conduits from? Well, they are just like gear loot drops or relics from Legion, obtainable from a variety of sources, be dungeons, raids, or from PvP, like the new vendors. Yep, vendors, more on the gearing changes later on, and even on world quests. A conduit will also contain an item level, a rank. The higher the difficulty you obtain it from, the more powerful the conduit is gonna be, increasing its uptime or the damage percentages depending on the conduit effect, and once you acquire it, you can simply take it back to your Covenant Sanctum and add it to your library at the Forge of Bonds, or upgrade it if you just obtained a more powerful version. All that said, the traits and their respective conduit slots won't be fully unlocked as you see here in the video. Much like the Azerite traits at the start of BFA, there will be some gated progression with your covenant in order to unlock those traits and slots in the form of renown, a form of currency meets reputation, a stance with your covenant. And like Artifact Power, it is not grindy or time-consuming at all, and it's actually finite. We will cover how you get Renown momentarily. So, as you get more and more Renown levels, you're gonna unlock more and more traits, and you conduit slots and grow more powerful. You can then change Soulbinds or the paths of the traits for different loadouts, like say for an off-spec, or for a specific encounter or need. However, changing conduits on themselves, that's where you it's gonna get a little bit a little bit tricky as currently there's one week lockout in order to change your conduits as opposed to the traits themselves though hopefully that will change before release there's some issues with conduits for sure if you want to play some off spec and there's a trait that you really want but hey just letting you know how it works currently so renown what is it exactly it's essentially your standing with your covenant as i said it's your new artifact or neck level at different level brackets you will unlock the set soulbind traits and the conduit slots along with getting tons of different cosmetic rewards like the very cool tier set and the cloaked transmog many of you probably saw, the mounts, among other things that you can see there on the screen. Your campaign, which also unlocks many of these cosmetics, is inherently connected to your renown. You will get some renown by doing campaign quests, and renown will also unlock more campaign quests and so on and so forth. That said, you also have two very simple weekly quests on top of that to get renown, 
offered by your covenant, one that will task you to gather 1500 anima for your covenant, and the other to gather 15 souls from the maw. And that said, simple weekly quests that just takes about one hour total, thereabouts, uh, this will be your main weekly grind for player power, for the renown. Yes, just that. Another great thing about Renown is that it caps at 40, so unlike AP, once it's done, it's done. But aside from Renown and their cosmetic and power rewards, you also have your Covenant Sanctum upgrades with its own progression system that can also be locked behind some Renown levels for the higher ranks, while also costing Anima and Souls for the set upgrades. So this is where we're gonna discuss and explain those systems or rather currencies that are tied to your Renown quests. Essentially, Sanctums work a bit like Garrisons meets class halls. You're gonna get these four stations that you can upgrade, ranging from a teleportation network, giving you instant portals like extra fly paths around the zone of your covenant, in the case of the Kyrian, or your own personal necropolis as a necrolords or some extra portals for in around the zone, or teleporting mirrors for the Venthyr, and a mushroom network for the Night Fae. And this system is kind of replacing the whistle from the past expansions and helping you out from not having flying till a later patch, especially since some of these zones have some really annoying verticality. It is also improving your new mission table, called the Adventure Table. Uh, more on this in a dedicated video to Covenants overall, but it is essentially the same as your typical table, but uh, with some changes to the way you acquire the characters, with some quests and stuff, and how it's all presented in a more RPG fashion with a lot more numbers and stuff like that. The Sanctum upgrades will also allow you to unlock and upgrade the Anima Conductor, so what the hell is that? This is where we get to Anima, Souls, and essentially world content that has changed quite drastically from BFA and Legion. So Anima. What is Anima? Anima essentially powers everything within your sanctum. It is the life source of the Shadowlands, and so in gameplay terms, it's essentially war resources that you can use to upgrade your sanctum, that you're gonna need for your weekly quest, buy some cosmetic items on some vendors, and use it here on the Anima Conductor. It is not something like artifact power, as you may have assumed, like the closest comparison is actually the Renown, as we covered. Anima is gonna come from a variety of different sources within the game, but primarily from world quests and callings or general world content. Callings, in turn, are your new emissaries that you have to pick up like a daily in your sanctum. You're gonna get one every day for a max of three. But unlike emissaries, which is always the same, they resemble more like a Mechagon daily or the assaults as their requirements will vary. Sometimes they may ask for four world quests, other times just go and defend a specific Shadowlands zone, and there you can do anything to fill the bar. Treasures, rares, world quests, or even the dungeons within that zone. Other times might even just ask you for you to defeat a powerful enemy. This might be a group-based world quest or a dungeon. Or you get five types of these items that only drops from rares or treasures. Other times it might even send you to the mall to get Stygia. More on that later too. So callings, emissaries have a lot more variety to them, and they are gonna give rewards akin to emissaries, gear likely for catch-up, probably some other cosmetics, but big chunks of anima that then you can deposit on your own Covenant's anima reservoir as they come in in the artifact-like consumables. Now, the cool thing about this is that for the most part is completely optional. Outside of the weekly that tasks you to get 1500 anima to get renown for player power, from from that point on, it is entirely up to you to farm, yes farm, anima or not, to upgrade your sanctum as you're not getting any direct power from it, it's just making your life easier. So that feeling of having to do chores every day, or if you miss a day and it feels awful, it is for the most part completely gone. World quests, which also grants anima, like the callings, have also changed by quite a bit. They are much fewer per zone, about 4 or 5 total, and also lengthier. For the most part, I find them to be a bit of a hit and miss. There's quite a few of them which are quite creative, like a Flappy Birds minigame, uh, floating on umbrellas, uh, jumping on clouds, which is horrible with a beta lag from the EU, or other cool endearing quests, 
but you also have quests that feel quite lengthy, having you kill or collect higher than normal amount of items from what you expect from a regular world quest. PvP world quests also make a comeback, rewarding honor. So, in a general sense, it's gonna take you a bit longer to do world quests, but again, they are done at your own discretion, as they are not directly tied to player power, unless you are looking for a piece of gear for catching up on an alt or the weekly. The anima conductor will then enter the fold here, as once you unlock it and you go up in the ranks in your sanctum upgrades, it will allow you to funnel any extra anima you may have to a specific area of your covenant zone for 24 hours for a day, granting access to a new world quest, a new rare enemy, a new treasure, which by the way are a lot more like treasures now, not only containing grey useless items, a world quest for a dungeon, and so on. And so, as you get more and more funneled points as you upgrade and you funnel more and more anima, you're gonna be able to reinforce a permanent point that will stay forever and not just for the 24 hours permanently unlocking that bonus objective world quest. And then you progressively will unlock more and more as a little progression system for your world content for your zone. Pretty cool, pretty simple, that is also finite. Where then souls come in then? Souls are in many ways like anima. It is yet another currency, but instead of getting them from the four Shadowland zones, you can only get them from the mall, your initial intro zone. It is the jailer zone. This is kind of like our in-game zone, and currently it feels a little bit incomplete, but going to this zone you're not going to be able to mount, and you're going to find cages and, l and little events where you're going to be able to obtain souls to power up again your sanctum. Like it, you're going to bring these souls uh, not to the reservoir, but to your soul warden. It is tied to your weekly renowned quest, but beyond that you can farm for souls as much as you want, much like anima where you can just do world content for extra if you so wish to get those sanctum upgrades quicker. You're also going to be able to obtain Stygia in the Maw, which is a Maw specific currency that has some dark Stolzy elements, which is neat, like dropping half the Stygia you own when you die, and then you have to get back to your corpse to get it back. And Stygia will allow you to purchase some items that will make your life easier in the Maw from Venari, a character that will meet pretty early on in the Maw that is going to provide you all the quests and directions here. He will also also now provide you an item to add uh, gem sockets to your gear, but more about that in the gearing changes section. And you're gonna do some hidden world quests and you're gonna kill some rares for Stygia and so on. And there's gonna be some progression within the zone, a bit akin to visions, as some areas have some like negative debuffs, so there's higher risk for higher rewards like areas like a fear debuff or the river of souls that heavily damages you but can be mitigated by items consumables that you can buy with stygia and like visions there's going to be a soft limitation to being this zone daily as the more rares you kill or bonus objectives you do or any other activity you're going to feel the eye of the jailer uh, think of it as the gta wanted level and at each level you're going to get some extra threats like some assassins coming at you to kill you towers shooting at you dealing a lot of damage and rooting you in place, and at 5 stars, the Jailer simply kills you, and you have to come back the other day when the eye is reset. It's a cool idea, this is a very sandboxy zone, however, it still currently feels very incomplete, so a dedicated guide will come later, and then hopefully I should be able to provide you with more information. Uh, but so far, it seems the item to add sockets to your gear has been the patch fix, to the mall to add more meaning to the mall so yeah also the mall visually looks pretty goddamn awesome with Thorgast, the jailer tower ever looming over you and the way to reach the mall is also freaking fantastic and lastly to wrap up your sanctum business you still have your little unique weekly event or activity which again is purely for fun but again dedicated video for it will come out as there's a lot to it but for you to get an idea of what you're getting this will be a side activity an almost mini game and like each covenant is thematically unique, so is this event. Like building your own abominations as a necrolord, dressing them up on the, all of these silly accessories, or going on gladiator matches with the Trials of Ascension for the Kyrian with your soulbinds. Um, these two function much like the Mechagon Crafter, where you progressively gonna get more blueprints and more things to upgrade this minigame essentially, taking you to the open world to farm for items like flesh for your abominations, to be able to craft them, or some other items for the accessories, or specific 
specific upgrades for your gladiator matches, getting more competitors to fight or getting items to craft some more equipment to get more abilities that then your soulbinds can use. Uh, the Night Fade then gets to nurture souls, spirits back to life in a special garden, so you will get those in an open world as well. Uh, the Vinthyr in turn will throw the famous party, the Ember Court. You're going to be getting guests and other festivities like entertainments and drinks. These are all quests that you're going to need to do to unlock all of these uh, components. Some are locked behind the campaign or other requirements like reps and it's all within the open world like environment but once again I cannot stress this enough these are purely optional that have a lengthy progression system attached to them that can also be tied to renown due to the nature of upgrading your st or your stations but all the farming involved like getting all the required items getting all the anima getting all the souls for the upgrades and getting all the items for the specific events is also quite lengthy, but ultimately it serves as a way to get you out to the open world more, outside of world quests and dailies, and getting all the items or quests that you need, to then do some silly fun things, especially in times where you want to play some WoW but don't feel like doing anything serious. As for the weekly part of the event that gets thrown around, just means that some things are locked weekly. The party, for example, can be done on a weekly basis, but you can still progress it, like getting the guests and getting the festivities any day of the week. The abominations will give you a weekly quest, but you can build as many abominations or get as many accessory items any day of the week as well. The Kyrian Trials will require a special currency to attend the matches, so you're gonna have to farm those weekly as well, but you can get all of the competitors and you can get the items for the abilities any day of the week and the Fake Garden will net you big rewards on a weekly basis but you can farm for the souls, you can plant the souls every 24 hours as that is uh, how long they take to grow, essentially. Uh, speaking of rewards, this event is also going to reward you with the Cosmetic Covenant tier set. In fact, you can have a couple of different tents each tied to a specific part of your covenant, along with some other cosmetic rewards like mounts. It's all a little bit unclear right now, like the Ember Court gets a full-fledged vendor and a specific reputation dedicated to it, a lot like the Pandaria Tillers, but the other events don't really get that. Uh, these rewards usually become much clearer uh, at release or just before with every new build. So that covers your Covenant Sanctum and some other features connected to it, like the Maw. Uh, pretty awesome, again, they get the bad rep due to their player power, but taking that aside, they are a really cool piece of content that you can have some fun with no strings attached. Can you change covenants though? That's likely a pretty big question then. What if you want to try an ability or the event of another covenant or you simply think that you made the wrong choice? Well, yes, yes you can. Going to a new covenant is pretty easy. You can just do it. It will be fine. You just go to Arbos and you talk to the covenant guy and you can just follow that quest and you're going to join a covenant like it was the first time. But returning to a past covenant you were in, that will take some effort. Currently is tasking you with the fill the bar quest in the zone of the covenant you want to join by doing world quests, rares, etc. Or even the dungeons in that zone. And then after the following week, you're going to get another bar to fill. Uh, take this with a grain of salt as is all subject to change, but ultimately is going to take you at least two weeks or one reset to change your covenant, or rather to go back to a covenant you were previously in, even though those objectives are reasonably quick to do, especially if you do them through dungeons. Bear in mind as well that going to a new covenant, you will have to regrind Renown and do all of the campaign to unlock all of the soulbinds and all of that, so you're going to have some catch-up mechanisms the same way as alt, so you're going to get renown from other sources as well on top of that, on top of the weekly quests and stuff. And all the progress that you do is saved, even after you change covenants or you go to another covenant and you come back, everything will stay there as it was before. And while you are in the process of going back to a covenant, so during those filled up our quests, you stay within your current covenant. So you're not never going to be in a place where you are without covenants. So don't worry about that. Now, outside of changing covenants on your main and all of that, what about alts? Alts are actually pretty goddamn cool. All of your leveling will be opened up and you will be given the option after your intro quest at an NPC, the Fate Scribe, to choose either to follow the same linear experience as your main, so through the campaign quests, or have it be 
completely opened up with no story, no campaign quests, you actually go into the future and all of that has already passed. And instead, you're going to get some additional bonus objectives for XP in all of the zones. So you will be able to level in a more sandboxy way with no restrictions on the zones. You can choose whatever, you can go whatever and do whatever. You also will be able to join a covenant immediately to get the abilities straight off. There's not even the intro quests to go through, uh, or you can simply rely on the trial system uh, like in your main to just test the abilities before you settle down on an option. But even if you don't settle down, settle down on uh, Covenant, you can easily change to another one pretty easily at max level. You also gonna receive some bonuses like Anima or Renown while doing those bonus objectives in the zones while you are leveling as a form of catch up. So overall, alts in Shadowlands, when it comes to leveling and even at max level, all the catch up in place, pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Now, taking aside Sanctums and Covenants, we also gonna have some changes to reputations themselves. Uh, Renown is not actually replacing it, by the way. Remember in BFA where you had to grind champions of Azeroth and so on? And do you remember the days of the old expansions where some rep reputations were there just for fun and they felt like they had a presence in the world, like the Netherwing and stuff? Well, that's back as well. Each zone has a specific reputation attached, as you probably figured out, but the grind, the farm involved with them have almost no player power attached to them as well, outside of some recipes with the big profession changes that we also gonna talk about. You're gonna get reputation from the usual sources, world quests, callings, <clears throat> a couple of quests and dailies, but also from daily dungeons like quests. And I know I don't mean the ones that you get on callings, like actual quests that you pick up in Orbos to get a big chunk of rep. Yep, daily like dungeon quests are also back. There's even a reputation like the Avowed in Ravendreth that you can actively farm mobs and items, yes, farm mobs and items for rep and kill some extra rares. Classic or TPC style. I never thought I would see these farmable reps back, but yeah, they are back. Now, I say for the most part they are optional because of player power due to professions. So, <clears throat> right, professions. So there's big and some amazing changes to professions, I might say so myself. Um, in the pre-patch video, we covered the relics of the past items that you can use to upgrade the item level of old items, but for the Shadowlands, there's something very similar for the max level items in the form of Crafter's Mark, a BOP item that you can slot into an item while crafting it to increase its item level. There's gonna be four variants and it's maxed at 200 item level, equivalent to Castle Nathria, the new raid, normal raiding gear. Now, these are locked behind the reputation grind. It is the only power-based things that I found locked behind reps. But it makes sense because crafted gear in Shadowlands fills every single gear slot except for one single trinket. You may craft a shitty green bow or a shitty green leg or a belt or any other item, but by adding these reagents, you'll make it into an epic 200 item level bow. Meaning that later in the patches, when people have grinded the reps, you may have have alts full of 200 item level crafted gear ready to go to heroic castle natria raid the minute that you ding if you can afford that there is but overall pretty fantastic for alts not only that you may also choose what stats those items will have with missives crafted with inscription simply place them you choose the stat and done not only that again, there's also a higher variety of consumables from a variety of professions, like sharpening stones from the blacksmith, stamina armor kits from the leather workers, oils from alchemy to apply to your weapons, and etc. All the very classic consumables are also back. Although we have many of the old consumables taking a break, like the class buff scrolls, so F for that. So there's a really healthy organism with professions going for Shadowlands worthwhile crafted gear that makes sense with a lot of agency, with a lot of sense for alts and stuff, much more consumables like items to keep a constant flow of trade, and crafted legendaries. Yes, legendaries. So let's talk about that. In Shadowlands, we will have crafted legendaries that any character may do as it's 
technically the rune carver that will do so for you that you're gonna unlock pretty early on at cap when you choose your covenant and you're gonna get some chain quests to go to the mall and to go to Torghast. but you're gonna rely on crafting professions to provide you with some items so to craft legendaries you first gonna need the recipe for the legendary power and you're gonna obtain those like conduits or gear dungeons raids pvp so on even world bosses which is kind of sucks the level of difficulty also doesn't seem to matter giving you some old powers back like from legion legendaries or old tier sets or astride traits which is not very exciting or something new entirely further increasing your character power that you may also switch at any time as well according to your needs and like covenant abilities or conduits. You also have a huge array of general legendary powers that anyone can use that increases your player power in specific types of content or zones, like in the Maw, or in Torghast, or in general Shadowlands zones, which is pretty neat. After, you're gonna need a base item, which is crafted by the crafting professions. Tailor, leather worker, jewel crafter for rings and necklaces, so on. Legendaries can be of any slot except for trinkets. That said, legendary powers are locked to two, uh, to two specified slots of gear, so you cannot apply any power to any slot, so bear that in mind. These crafted base items will follow different rules to the ones we discussed previously. These will have a ranking system of 1 to 10 in order to reach rank 2 and so on, so the more you craft them, the higher the rank you're gonna get as a crafter, and that will mean a higher item level base legendary item. For a higher item level legendary item, itself, meaning this based item will be the main component that will define your legendary item level. So you're going to be reliant on your crafter's skill for your legendary item level, which is pretty cool. Along with it, you're also going to need the missives to select what secondary stats that you want, just like the regular crafted items, which is also pretty awesome. To finish it off, you're going to need Solash, a currency obtained in Torghast, our new big feature that we also going to talk about later, and after you can simply tell the rune carver to craft it. Now, you may also upgrade your legendary item level later on in case you crafted one with a lower item level base item, so don't worry about that. This will be something that will likely be kept up to date as patches roll out and so on. So pretty simple, awesome system, full of agency and choice, while also giving even more meaning to professions. Not only that, legendaries offer a fantastic looking transmog set for each armor type. Really, really freaking nice. So, on to Torghast. What's that? How do you get Solash? Well, this is going to be the new weekly thing that you're going to feel obligated to do on top of the weekly quests for player power, but personally also doesn't feel all that grindy. Torghast also deserves its own video because there's a lot to it, but to get an idea of what you're getting, it will be your new instance-based content that you can do solo or in a group of five, and it's following a semi-roguelike RPG approach. That will be explained. Torghast will be accessible from a portal within them all, unlocked shortly after choosing your covenant, as you go through the chain quests, and as you enter this gargantuan tower after completing its set intro quests, you are given a choice of two halls, two instances to run, that change on a weekly basis. There is a total of six differently thematic halls, like one is fire-ish, one that is more necromanch, greenish, another one that is more plague-ish, wait, yellowish. It is also from here you get to the rune carver room, the minute you enter to your right there's a little corridor leading you to him, uh, don't worry there will be quests to unlock all of this so you will be guided very easily through it. These halls work kind of like dungeons meets visions meets scenarios, where you're gonna go through six floors, separated by tiny loading screens, pseudo randomly generated, and I say that, but I mean, it's not really, it's kind of different placements on enemies and kind of different corridors that you're gonna run through every single run with one mini boss at the end of each floor and one big boss at the end of each of the, at the end of the sixth floor. 
You're going to be dodging very deadly traps in between the enemies and exploring the corridors that can actually kill you, which is pretty cool, doing simple quests akin to islands and some little puzzles with treasures. But along the way, you're going to get these temporary power-ups called Anima Powers, droppable from enemies or destroyable objects or just by exploring the corridors, doing all sorts of silly things for your character, like more powerful abilities, up to 2000% more damage, more frequent CDs, and so much more. The goal here is for you to mix and match these random powers that come your way, to make your character super mega powerful and break the game basically in very silly ways, and face the dangers of the halls of the tower. You won't be able to change gear or talents in Torghast due to the Jailer's Chains akin to Mythic Plus, but at every three floors a vendor will be at your disposal where you can purchase a couple of items and more anime powers, along with being able to change talents or gear in this safe bubble. One of these items will be to increase your death count, as Torghast has a death counter of 5, hence it being kinda inspired by roguelike games. If you die more than that, a very dangerous terror goo comes after you, instantly killing you. Uh, think of it as a balrog of death, but you can CC him for a little bit. Torghast won't be timely based or require any currency like visions, you can take all the time in the world and approach it in any way you see fit and simply have fun with it. At the end of each run, after defeating the main boss, you will get Soul Ash to use to craft your legendaries, meaning that also in time you may opt out to completely not do Torghast if you already have your one and only legendary that you want, at least for a while. That said, there is a progression system for each of the six halls presented to you, named Layers, and locked after each successful run. Think of it like Masks in Visions, where you can choose the difficulty before you enter. The higher the layer, the more difficult it will be, but also a bigger Soul Ash reward. It is cumulative, so if you can do a Layer 5 run, you won't need to do any of the previous ones. Alternatively, Torghast will offer a lengthier mode, and a more challenging mode of 18 floors called the Twisting Corridors, where you will face bigger challenges as it runs for much longer, so you will face much tougher enemies, and personally this is where the fun of Torghast lies, as you can stay there for longer to build your character with more crazy anima powers and face more interesting enemies. It also includes the layer system, so there's gonna be higher difficulty for even bigger challenges. So think of it as a semi-mage tower. But rewards here will be purely cosmetic, just like a Mage Tower, no Soul Ash, just some Stygia and many achievements and mounts and transmogs and pets and all those things that you might have expect can be found here in the Twisting Corridors. So that's the gist of Torghast. Personally, I find it fun, especially the Twisting Corridors. The sixth runs, the sixth floor runs for Soul Ash is a little bit boring because they end super quick, it's not very interesting, but it's without a grindy feel to it as a normal Soul Ash run it will take you about 20 minutes to 30 minutes as a weekly thing, rewarding you 25 Soul Ash for a layer one run, while a legendary only takes 100 Soul Ash to craft, though numbers are likely, very likely to change, and depending on the quality of the legendary, the, those numbers might go higher. Higher, rather. While a cosmetic, the challenge mode, the twists and corridors, the run will likely average out to 40 minutes to one hour, so it will take much longer. Uh, souls for your sanctum also seem to be obtainable here in Torghast, but it's kind of bugged in my currency tab. I click on them, I get them, but then it doesn't really apply, so I'm not going to say for sure that you can actually get souls here. But that's what you're going to get as your new big feature and why you're going to need to do it. And lastly, there's the gearing changes. We talked about the few, but gear will be gear in Shadowlands with no silly random systems like Corruption or Titan Forging, which is also great. We're gonna get the new weekly cash in the form of the Great Vault, giving rewards beyond just doing Mythic Plus, tracking your weekly progress with raids and PvP as well, granting a variety of items depending on your efforts on your weekly cash. Yes, you're gonna get more than one item, depending on how many of these you actually complete, that you can actively choose one from that pool of items, and if you don't want any, you're likely gonna be able to choose either to get anima or renown. 
Weapon drops in raids also change slightly now in the form of dropping tokens, mostly so specs like the Frosty Ks or the Fury Warriors or the Monks that now have different weapon types that they can choose from don't feel like they get a weapon drop in a raid that they don't want to use, so tokens now take their place and they are thematic around your covenant. When it comes to gem sockets that we briefly discussed, they're gonna stay randomized on loot drops or on craft, but you're gonna be able to apply them with an item from the mob vendor, Venari, to add a socket akin to gouge eyes, but it's being limited to a couple of gear slots. Either way, it's pretty cool. They might change a couple of things because farming the mob might not be for everybody, so take that with the grain of salt. PvP also gets their vendors through conquest points and honor, and their gear will be upgradable akin to benthic gear, but these are still under heavy tuning as they had some itemization, itemization issues. But overall, gearing is looking really quite nice with best lists making a comeback in, here in Shadowlands, so pretty awesome. And lastly, we have what you can expect new content to be in a new expansion like uh, new dungeons we have a total of eight which are all pretty cool and the new raid castle nathria i haven't done the raid because i actually want something to feel fresh when i actually play the goddamn thing but from friends and fellow content creators it's looking rather great as well for the most part uh, Mythic Plus also gets a few new affixes and some of them that are now retired, but they're still being heavily tuned, so take it as you will. Uh, the new season affix, though, that looks pretty awesome with some uh, Kiss Curse effects. All that said, one of the amazing things about Shadowlands as a whole is that if you enjoy raiding, if you enjoy doing Mythic Plus or PvP is the only thing that you care about, you can just focus on that taking aside covenant abilities. There's very little grinds and arbitrary chores that you need to do, with seemingly a lot of optional fun content. I personally love that approach, so do let me know yours. What is your perspective? So yeah guys, that covers all the things coming in Shadowlands, pretty goddamn big video and holy did it take me a very long time to make so keep a look out for future videos like this uh, tier lists on classes and specs a look at all the covenant abilities choosing your main and eventually dedicated guides for each of these big systems do remember to subscribe to get all of that and as always thank you for watching and i'll see you all next time goodbye my friend